with our uh, first story is a drudge link that was uh, we called it the super juicy today and um, it was TSA trained Super Bowl hot dog sellers to spot terrorists and there you can see the spot on drudge and uh, it seems like an over 8,000 stadiums uh, 8,000 stadium vendor, parking lot attendants, shuttle bus drivers, and other transportation officials received the agency's first observer training for detecting and assessing indicators and planning tactics of potential terrorist activities. So these people will be doing double duty. In addition to slinging you hot dogs and beverages and stuff, they are going to be asking you questions about where you're going and what you're doing, maybe even grabbing a little junk here and there and pretty pretty interesting how the TSA has managed to just worm their way into every facet of our lives and uh, no one's gonna say anything and I'm sure they'll gloss over it during Super Bowl coverage and make it seem like it's a great thing for you and I so anyway that was our top link on Drudge today and thanks for Drudge for linking to that our next story goes into Fast and Furious and where uh, it was February 2nd Eric Holder went before um, Congress again and this time to answer more questions, which he didn't do. He, he stated there's no attempt at any kind of a cover-up. Holder told lawmakers well into a hearing about whether he'd been forthright in responding to requests of the House Oversight and Government Re Relations Committee, led by ISSA, who we found out earlier this week when we had Wayne Madsen on that he was known as a car thief before he became a congressman. And uh, so looking at this article... I did some a little bit of digging just in the, the different stories we had covered into Fast and Furious. There's an InfoWars article that uh, ATF had plotted to use this to demonize the Second Amendment. And we have the email quotes. Uh, let's pull those up real quick. So out of InfoWars, the email showed ATF members congratulating each other for blaming border violence on guns bought from U.S. dealers, despite the fact that the feds were the ones delivering them straight to the Mexican criminals under the program Fast and Furious. And it went on to say that uh, some of these firearms dealers were concerned that these guns were ending up in the bad guys, only to be reassured by the ATF that there's nothing to worry about. So obviously, Holder was not doing any type of cover-up. And uh, we have another article from CBS News. Even they were documenting the fact that the ATF wanted to use Fast and Furious to make a case for gun regulations. Moving on, we'll go to the weekly standard that shows that the Obama administration sealed the records of Fast and Furious and the death of Agent Brian Terry. And they sealed the court records containing alarming details of how Mexican drug smugglers and a murdered a U.S. border agent with a gun and connected to, connected to a failed federal experiment that allowed firearms to be smuggled into Mexico. And that's not all. We also have a Department of Justice memo dated April 2nd, 2009. And here, this is from Eric Holder, where he's going into Mexico, Cornavaca to be exact, and telling him, telling him that we're going to be putting agents and money into this whole new effort, and we're committing all these resources to making sure that, uh, to supplement our project gun runner. So there you go. Obviously, Holder has no idea what's going on, and the buck doesn't stop with him, and these ATF agents are just out of control acting on their own cognizance, uh, creating this program. Yeah, we really believe that. In fact, we know this was going on before in the Bush administration. Here's uh, Daryl Issa talking about that on Meet the Press. And again, we know that under the Bush administration, there were similar operations, but they were coordinated with Mexico. Uh, they made every effort to keep their eyes on the weapons the whole time. So we're not per se saying that tracing weapons is a bad okay. idea. Uh, well, Cheryl, uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Yeah, we don't think tracing weapons is a bad idea as long as Republicans are doing it. So, see, both sides are doing it, and we're going to illustrate that with uh, some Monsanto news later, that it's both sides of the, of the coin that are trying to poison you and run weapons into Mexico to blame it on the Second Amendment. Moving on, U.S. uses depleted uranium... Uh, makes graveyards in Afghanistan, and this has to do with the fact that in almost every type of machinery and every type of weapon that we have, including the A-10 Warthog, the Apache helicopters, the Bradley vehicles, uh, all contain DU munitions. And every time they shoot those in the ground or fire their gun, they're creating DU dust that people are breathing in. It's causing cancers and sores. In fact, they uh, did a examination of the urine uh, and found uranium isotopes which are 300 percent to 2,000 percent higher than normal levels. 
And uh, if you look at Afghanistan as well as Iraq and in Yugoslavia, you find that wherever these weapons are used, you will find graveyards of people dying from cancer and other unusual diseases. And we've had Dr. Doug Rocky on to explain this and how his team, when they were looking into it, they all started dropping dead. And he's not doing too well himself just from the exposure. And this is happening to our men and women who are also using these weapons and then coming home and spreading it to their kids, to their spouses, to anything they touch. It's just not a good thing, and we should not be using depleted uranium. We shouldn't be taking radioactive waste, putting it into our munitions, and then firing it around, sort of like the same thing that we do with fluoride in the water supply. We're taking a toxic waste and diluting it around to try to mitigate some of the factors of it. And now we come to another interesting article that's had some, a lot of, it's been a pretty hot article, uh, or pretty hot subject the last couple of days. After cutting ties with Planned Parenthood, coma donations up 100%. And in the wake of this week's announcement that Susan G. Komen for the Cure will no longer be awarding grants to Planned Parenthood, the breast cancer organization's donations have gone up 100% in the last two days. And um, it was it Nancy Brinkler, or and I'm sorry, Nancy Brinker, founder and CEO of the Komen Foundation, said our donations are up 100% the past two days. We understand and we get very emotional too. We do this every single day of our lives. Now, that was on the second. Today, we have two articles, one from the Wall Street Journal, one from Fox News. So we look at Fox News. Komen drops plans to cut Planned Parenthood grants. Apparently, they're having a 180 on this. And then we go also to the Wall Street Journal, pretty much the same headline, Komen drops plans to cut Planned Parenthood grants. So now, I guess they're having an about face on this issue. And we're going to have... Uh, Pastor Clinton Childress, who we did a really long expose into the abortion industry, oh, I guess it was two money bombs ago, we played his interview, and we're going to have him on Monday to kind of go over this issue and explain things, and, and in fact, we have a clip from Pastor Childress here from that interview talking about when you get an abortion, it increases your chances of cancer, which is why Susan G. Komen, if they're an organization dedicated to fighting cancer, should not be giving money to a group that their procedures actually increase the chance of cancer, if that makes sense. Here's the clip. You know, your listeners ought to know that abortion is the most performed operation on a woman. If there's 12% African Americans in this country and they're accounting for, I'm going to use this figure, this is extremely conservative, 37% of the abortions of the nation. Yeah, that's 37%. That means that African American women, you know, are having this operation performed on them more than any other woman, and to the point where that it is genocidal when it comes to the number of live births. Why did I say that? Well, up until 1973, breast cancer was not an issue with African American women. It was not a problem. Now it's epidemic. And uh, Joel Bren, who's from this great state of New Jersey. <laughs> Um, more or less did 28 studies, 21 conclusive, that there is a link between a woman who has abor an abortion, especially a first term pregnancy, and uh, chooses to abort, will over 500 percent in some studies have uh, uh, basically will contract uh, breast cancer. It is a recent study in Turkey uh, they concluded 66% of women will contract breast cancer. Your, your, your chances increase 66%. And simply because when you, you miscarry, when a woman miscarries, the brain knows it and sends messages throughout the body shut down. When you surgically do it and you, and you abort the child surgically, the brain does not recognize that and it continually sends signals and what uh, organ is affected by it the most is the breast of a woman. It, by the time it begins to shut down and realize there's no child, there's so many hormones and other things that are there and they become cancerous later on. Now, African American women now lead the country in preterm deaths of their children because abortion is being sold to African American women as a contraceptive which is unquestionably the most detrimental thing other than the death of the child because you now have created a, uh, a situation with this woman that she's not able to carry full term when she wants a child. 
And so um, preterm deaths, once again, was not an issue in the African-American community. And now they lead the country. And don't take it from Reverend Childress. Look up the information yourself. Look up the studies that have been done. Check that out. And regardless of what your position is on abortion, if girls 16, 17, 18, these young women who are going in there using this as contraception, they need to be educated to the fact that their chances of cancer are going to go up and their chances of never having children are going to go up if they go through this procedure. And, um, you know, that's, that's really what we have to look at. So uh, I would ask Susan G. Combe to reconsider. If they really are interested in stopping cancers, they should not be funding an organization whose procedures actually lead to the increase of cancer. Moving on to another glorious topic of HPV vaccines. This comes from Kurt Lenderman Sr., who uh, writes articles from time to time, has been a guest on this show. HPV Vaccine Victims Advocacy Group sends open letter to HHS Secretary Kathleen Sabellis. She was the former governor of Kansas. And in it, and there, the group is called SaneVax. You can find out more about them at sanevax.org. They state that uh, these studies, 2.6 to 6.2 more HPV vaccinated young women experienced other high risks HPV infections than unvac and unvaccinated women. And when one considers the drastic number of adverse reactions and the lack of proof of any post-marketing studies showing for success of the vaccines and outcry from patients regarding draconian measures from governments to force girls and now boys to get vac vaccinated, Secretary Sabellis, the HHS, and the FDA should immediately stop the HPV vac vaccine recommendations and forcibly remove the product from market. This is a very, very strong cry, and I'd like to commend SaneVax for making this. By the way, it states that there's been over 24,000 documented adverse reactions to this vaccine, over 3,000 very serious. But wait. The, the National Vaccine Information Center claims that less than 10% of adverse reactions are actually reported. So this number is probably a lot higher than what is stated in this article. And this is very, very sad that a lot of women out there, a lot of our young women, are being told this is for their protection and it ends up hurting them really badly. Moving on to the economy. Ben Bernanke, this is out of USA Today, urges caution in overly rapid deficit cutting. And we also have a clip from him. But Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke def defended the central bank's decision to hold interest rates at record low levels so they could keep giving lots of free money to the banks so then they could lend it to you at higher interest rates, thereby making a profit while you pay out the nose. And for the next three years, during a contentious hearing Thursday before federal lawmakers. Let's go to the clip. Moreover, this sluggish expansion has left the economy vulnerable to shocks. Indeed, last year, supply chain disruptions stemming from the earthquake in Japan, a surge in the prices of oil and other commodities and spillovers from the European debt crisis risk derailing the recovery. The outlook remains uncertain, however, and close monitoring of economic developments will remain necessary. We had Bob Chapman on today's radio show, and he explained that this is probably going to actually cre create growth in the government, maybe 2 percent, or it's going to be kind of uh, sideways growth, which really means no growth at all, instead of the negative 2% they were expecting, and this is because they're just printing more money, and pretty soon QE3 is going to happen, and, you know, we're going to lead up to this another, next bubble that will then crash, and the cycle will repeat itself until people decide to end the Fed. Moving on to the United Nations. <clears throat> UN wants, to, wants a world tax to help the poor. And uh, this has come from Deputy Director of United Nations Development Program, Jens Wendell, states he wants a minimal financial tax of 0.005% that will create $40 billion in revenue. And let me tell you, it's going to take a lot more than $40 billion in revenue to feed the poor with what he, what he describes as people getting free housing, education, and health care. And what kind of free housing, education, and health care will you be getting? Will it be that you have to worship the UN? Will it be that you have to get a microchip in order to get this? I wonder how they're going to implement this type of program and then track all the people doing it. We know how they're going to do it. We know it has to do with microchips, and we know it has to do with forcing people onto vaccines, and it has nothing to do with creating a, this free utopia that this article states that they're going to do. And obviously, Paul Joseph Watson knows that that's not what they want to do. It's just another case of the UN stepping in 
and trying to remedy a problem that they actually helped create in the first place. And if you think that bureaucracy is going to do anything with that money other than steal it for themselves, you got another thing coming.